Okay, so thank you to Ali for hosting this event. Uh, this event has come together in relatively short time. I also would like to recognize the five institutions that were mentioned in the slide along with the International Society for Industrial Ecology. Uh, and I also want to in particular mention Anders and Helen from NTNU in Norway who have been really the brought the program together really strongly in the last while. And I'm going to start on very safe common ground. We're going to talk about it. One of my objectives in this introduction is to sort of under, to try and communicate what is industrial ecology and what is its relation to the circular economy. And I need to do it in a very simple way because they're actually quite complicated topics. And I'm going to start with this statement, waste is some useful substance that we don't know how to use or we don't yet know how to use it economically from 1961. And, and society generally has been making progress to try and make better use of waste for a long, long time. And yet the circular economy package that the European Union is uh, is in the, in the process of creating could be a major, major uh, landmark and, and forward step in, in this battle against making better use of waste materials. And the, the industrial ecology as a group of scientists have been wrestling with this issue for a long time too. And there should be some coming together of of industrial ecology and the circular economy. And what's interesting, so if we go to the next slide, industrial ecology is an interdisciplinary applied science. It's the study of energy and material flows in industrial society. And so looking at circular flows within uh, of materials would, would naturally fall in under, in under, uh, under industrial ecology. Uh, the actual the members of the society actually debate. Some members of the ISIE think that, that really we are the science of the circular economy. And others see the circular economy more as sort of this aspirational thing and have studied material flows enough to know that it's very difficult to actually close loops and, and make circularity. And so, uh, and that's really the tension. That's really the exploration for today, I think. Now, in before I say much more about that, I do want to take a little bit of a while just to say more about the ISIE, because some of you are not familiar with the organization, but I, I, but you might be familiar with some of its outputs. And so basically, it's it, it, the, the field of industrial ecology is about 25, 26 years old. We started with the, with the idea that we, we should design industrial systems to close loops, a la the circular economy. So that's some, there's some commonality there. And... Uh, it's now the ISIE is, has a, a membership of about 500 uh, academics, policy people, industrialists worldwide uh, in about 40 different countries. And it's a mature organization. The academics are publishing in the top journals, the Nature and Science, as well as our own journal, the Journal of Industrial Ecology, which we'll talk about in a moment. Next slide. Uh, and I've put together this slide that shows some of the impacts it related to policy from work that's been done by industrial ecologists. So I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar with life cycle assessment. Within the ISIE, we have the people that created the first databases, wrote the standards, that, that or were part of the, the community that wrote the standards for life cycle assessment. Uh, we also have uh, advancements in input-output models that are used to study environmental impacts of of nations and, and other and regions and a huge amount of that work is being done by Arnold Tucker for example who's in the room and others in this community. Uh, the uh, environmental accounts of all European nations and OECD nations under Eurostat and, and the OECD the the methods uh, the techniques uh, the rules for doing those the material flows in those accounts was largely done by people in, in the ISIE community. There's the uh, United Nations International Resource Panel. Uh, the technical experts on that uh, that panel are largely colleagues of mine in this society, and contributions to IPCC reports and, and other and other things. So there's there's a lot. You can see that the the ISIE, the community, is covering a, a large range of areas. And my hope. Well, the reason why I'm saying this now is my hope is that coming out of the meeting today, there might be some contributions of members of the ISIE towards the circular economy package in Europe as it as it gets as it develops and goes forward. So uh, uh, I also want to mention that ISIE is not just a European organization. This is, I guess, maybe this slide's a little premature, but uh, you can see from the slide that we've got a meeting in Bogota next month, and then we've got meetings in the United States in June with Nagoya coming up in September, big meeting in Chicago in a year from now. So it's a very active society with doing work all over the world. Uh, thanks. Next. Uh, 
let's turn to today's objectives. So really, <laughs> what we want to bring to the discussion of the circular economy is some science. Some, so uh, as, this, as, an, as an applied science, where we study energy and material flows based on simple laws of physics, conservation of energy, conservation of mass, applied in societal context. And, and we, we would hope that some of the presenters today will, will give insights into limits of circular economy or opportunities for circular economy that, that may help the policy dialogue going forward. And so, uh, and I think in particular, what we hope, I suspect will come out of the conversation here is, is, a, is a focus on the environment. I think there's, there's an almost an, uh, an unusual thing about the circular economy and even industrial ecology that it, it started off with a concern about reducing waste flows, which are obviously an environmental impact. And then soon then became a discussion about how do you do that in economic terms. And yet there are other environmental impacts that sometimes might have got missed out. And I think you'll see that, that coming back in in, in, the, in, today's, uh, in today's discussion. Uh, yeah, next one, please. Just to, to link back again, I mentioned earlier we have a journal, the Journal of Industrial Ecology. There's a flyer for it in the package there. But you can see that this journal has already been a venue for uh, policy and academic studies or scientific studies on the circular economy. I know Vili uh, has, who's the author of the last of those four there, is, is going to present shortly this morning. But you can go back to 2006, some of the first writings about the, the Chinese circular economy uh, ideas were published in the Journal of Industrial Ecology. So this is this is something that's already well embraced by the ISIE and the industrial ecology community. Uh, <clears throat> I was thinking, you know, since I'm sort of first up, I've, I've got to find some really, really simple ways of framing the complexity of the circular economy, that the number of different dimensions here. So I started with something that's maybe too simple, but goes back to some sort of founders in the area of industrial ecology who first started writing about, you know, how do we close material loops? And so uh, both Bob Ayers and, and, and Brad Allenby in, in their writings sort of said, well, we can think of three different types of materials, you know, those that we, we can technically and economically recycle or recover or reuse, those that we can do technically but economics isn't there, and those that we really can't, you know, become circular. We, toothpaste is not going to be a big part of the circular economy, I don't think, or, or shoe polish, certainly explosives, uh, fossil fuels, probably not. I mean, there are some materials that really are not going to be part of the circular economy. There's obviously metals that are up in that first category. And I guess the challenge for policymakers is really to move things from number two into number one, right? Or maybe there's some that can be moved from three to two with, a, with some real advances in technology, not the ones I mentioned, not, not the materials I just mentioned, I'd suspect. But that's really one way of, of, of framing this. But there's one thing that's really missed out here, unless you include it under technology, is something maybe technically and economically good, uh, and it could, could be reused, but is it environmentally good? So the next slide, and, and I think this will come through strongly in the last session today, but just to sort of give a, a teaser for this, this is some work or a slide from Tim Gutowski at MIT, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but he's been looking at a dozen or 15 different types of uh, products in terms of their remanufacturing and came to the conclusion that some of them actually used more energy for remanufacturing than the original manufacturing. And so depending on the nature of the energy, it may not be a good idea to remanufacture those particular products. So that's the sort of environmental angle that will come in here. Now, of course, the next slide. <coughs> so that question of energy becomes very important. And the question of what materials should be recycled and which ones shouldn't is always going to be context specific. And context is everything. So for example, what I'm showing on this uh, slide here is the uh, carbon intensities of electricity supply in the 15 largest greenhouse gas em emitting countries plus the European Union. And you can see that the carbon intensity ranges from less than 100 to almost 1,000 uh, tons of CO2 equivalents per gigawatt hour. So if you are remanufacturing something that was made in a high emission economy in a low emission economy, that might be a good idea. But the other way around may not be a good idea in terms of the environmental impacts of a circular economy. So that, and this is just looking at electricity, you know. So that, that, that context, context changes over time as well. So we're going to get into these kind of discussions in, in, in the, uh, in the day-to-day -day in terms of how you frame, you frame uh, uh, a particular policy consideration for a material or a product that you want to reuse in a circular economy. 
Uh, this, incidentally, this graph was concerned with a key threshold for electrification below about 500, uh, 600 uh, uh, tons per gigawatt hour. You, uh, electric vehicles are actually a, a good a good way forward. Anyway, so. <laughs> This is my last slide, essentially, it's a quick overview of the program to, to give you a sense of how, of how it comes together, how it's structured. The one thing that industrial ecologists do well or is central to industrial ecology is that we take a systems perspective to looking at energy and material flows. We frame issues, we define boundaries, spatial boundaries, time boundaries, environmental life cycle boundaries, and it, we, we frame them in order to to try and be completely uh, inclusive of all the issues that we're concerned about. And so we take a systems perspective for looking at energy material flows. So that's the first thing that's going to come through in the first, the first session, I hope. Then we're going to dive in and look at some specific uh, areas. We've got secondary materials and critical materials combined together. We've got a, a speaker and a panelist in each of those areas. We're going to talk about waste management, but waste management in the context of, of the circular economy. And then we're going to, although it will probably come up earlier, but we're going to strongly go into the environmental dimensions of the circular economy in the, in the fourth session. Uh, which I which I previously just introduced. So that's that's uh, all I need to say. And uh, with that, I'll hand it on back to Harry on to the next speaker.